Hello, viewers. My name is Matt Schell. I'll be stepping in for Joe Gordon from Brantford's Economic Development Commission. And today we have an exciting opportunity to meet with Professor William Nordhaus, who is one of the world's most prominent figures in economics. Uh, Professor Nordhaus, it's an honor to meet you. Good. Thank you so much. Yes. Nice to welcome you here. Yes. Thank you for having us. Also, happy Earth Day. Oh, it's yes, great time. Always... <laughs> yes. Um, you were born in New Mexico and went to Yale for your undergraduate and you also continued to MIT for your PhD. You were on the Brookings Panel for Economic Activity since 1972. Um, you were the author and editor of over 20 books and the economic advisor to President Jimmy Carter and of course, your Nobel Prize in 2018. Um, really an amazing resume and that little summary doesn't even come close to summarizing things. Um, so as a young person reading your resume, the first thing that kind of comes to my mind is how can somebody accomplish so much in such a short period of time? It's really amazing. And so to start, um, I think it might be fun to start all the way back and go back to New Mexico where you were born and maybe talk a little bit about the Sandia Peak uh, tramway and the significance of that. Sure. <laughs> so as you mentioned, I was born in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And my family goes back um, to the mid 19th century. My uncles and grandfathers and grandmothers um, emigrated from Germany during that period. My father grew up there. He was a lawyer and he was interested in many, many different areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he started uh, being a ski entrepreneur and he opened up some ski areas. And uh, one that is my favorite, it's called La Madera, means the woods, in, it's in Spanish. And it was right on the other side of the Sandia Mountains and that's where I learned to ski. <laughs> and uh, it's from that and other places around the Southwest that I really uh, learned to love what is, is our precious environment in, in many different areas. But it's a beautiful place to grow up, and uh, I, uh, I still love it and still go there in the summers. <laughs> and so you would have been about 25 years old uh, for the Sandia Peak Tramway. Yeah, process. yeah, the so. Sandia Peak Tramway, that was his dream. Mm -hmm. The Sandia Mountains, you have to drive around the mountains to get to the ski area, so he wanted to have a, a lift that goes up the west side. And if anybody's ever been in Albuquerque, it's a fabulous, fabulous journey, journey up there. Yep. through the different ecosystems. And then you get the top of the mountain, you can see, um, I don't know, 10,000 square miles around you. Uh, and that was his dream. And he sort of middle, in middle, mid late life, he, he yeah. fulfilled it. Um, so you were about 25 during that time and you would have been going from Yale to MIT. Um, I just wonder, looking at those early years, if there were any specific events that kind of were stepping stones towards this path of getting involved with climate in the future? Were there anything? Because when I looked back into about 1963, that's around the time of the Clean Air Act, for example. And I thought maybe there was a possibility of something early on that kind of led you in this direction. Yeah. I don't think there's anything that led me specifically to climate, to global warming. I call it global warming. It's kind of been sanitized recently yes. to climate change. Yes, it has. <laughs> uh, but there was nothing specific. But it was in, in part um, through studies I had started when I was a graduate student and then as a young faculty member when I came to Yale about the impact and the byproducts of economic growth. And so with my colleague James Tobin, who was a Yale economist, a very great Yale economist, we did studies of growth and the, the, the byproducts of growth. Mm -hmm. So a number of us at Yale, James Tobin, Charlie Koopmans, uh, other colleagues around the country were looking at some of the byproducts uh, and some of the harmful byproducts. And so we looked at a number of them, resource depletion, we looked at the depletion of oil and gas, we looked at lo local air pollution. Mm -hmm. And in the early 1970s, we, we looked at a number of these and we thought, well, this is just moderately serious, this isn't serious, mm -hmm. we're not going to run out of phosphate, we're, we're not going to heat the earth up through just uh, the waste heat of cities. But the one that we stumbled on that looked as if it was something that was both serious and something of durable interest was the climate, the global warming problem. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it was actually when I went to Vienna, Austria for a year, hmm. my, uh, my family and I went there. We spent a year at an in institute in Vienna 
I met, I met people there from different areas. It was a very multidisciplinary place. I shared an office with a climatologist, and it was right there that I developed my first serious interest in mm -hmm. the economics of climate change. So another one of your, your colleagues during the time was uh, Paul Samuelson, who was also another Nobel Prize winner. And um, I think that would have been around the time of MIT, possibly. But one of Paul Samuelson's biggest messages was the importance of math, really. That was his big message. And this seems like it's something that's um, very meaningful to you, too. And, you know, one of his statements, I can just read it, was basically mathematics is necessary to understand complex phenomena. That's one of his, his quotes. And I think you've used this before, too. But one of the problems I see nowadays is um, the general public's limited knowledge of just basic mathematical principles. And I was just wondering um, how you feel we stand nowadays with our understanding of math. And will that have a significant influence on our ability to successfully legislate in the future for climate change? Well, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I view math as a way of, it's like a shorthand. Yeah. You know how people take shorthand that you can, you can take something and you can write it out very arduously or you can just do it in a few little symbols. So my view of mathematics is it's a way of representing uh, complex or, or simplified or simple phenomena in a very concise way. Mm -hmm. So you can take something and you can, you can have a long sentence about something or you can write it out in a couple of equations. So it's a way of representing complex phenomena in very simple ways. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this was useful because some of the phenomena involved in global warming are ones which can be represented in equations. Mm -hmm. So equations are mathematics, and then once you have equations, you can also write them in computer code, and you can solve them and you can project them. So much of the work that people have done in this area, including the work we've done at Yale, mm -hmm. is taking ideas, the scientific ideas, representing them mathematically putting them into computer code, putting numbers on them that are coming from studies in different areas, and then run those code, just literally run them as a computer program to do projections, to do economic projections, to do uh, earth sciences projections. Mm -hmm. So I think, I th I think of, of mathematics as it's sort of like what's under the hood of the car. It's, 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 you don't have to really understand the deep mathematics to do this, but the car needs to understand that just to go down the street. Yes. Yeah. So I don't see the I don't see the this as an as an issue that is impeding our ability to deal with it as a as a as a country mm -hmm. or as we as individuals or we as, as citizens or as groups of countries because the basic principles and the basic phenomena can be stated very clearly just in words. Yes. Well, actually that's kind of interesting because Hamilton actually refers to math as its own language and um thinks about it in the same way. And I know at, at one point he was frustrated because he, he viewed math as, as important of the language as English was, and that not enough people would had a grasp enough to really understand things. And so it's, I guess it's comforting to, to hear your viewpoint that maybe we don't all need to be PhDs in mathematics to be able to legislate properly. We can look at things in a different way or in words, like you said, to make progress. So that's yeah. that's a positive thing. Yeah. No, I think that's <laughs> right. And we don't expect we don't expect every member of Congress to have a PhD in mathematics. We we would hope that they would be conversant with the basic principles of science yes. and legislation and that they would be open minded to new ideas and they would be able to recognize challenges and how to deal with them. That, that's really the open-mindedness is what we would hope in our legislators. Yes. <laughs> well, let's just talk about the Nobel Prize in specific. We should dive into that. Do you want to give just a brief overview of what the award was for? It's the Nobel Prize in economics, but maybe you can summarize your, your work. So I think we've talked about it a little bit already. It was for using economics to analyze the, the interrelationship of economic growth and the environment with particular reference to climate change. And it was both the analysis of that, which was to be able to put 
into, you could say equations, but it doesn't have to be equations, but, but we can say put into equations the basic relationships, such as the relationships between economic growth and carbon dioxide emissions, mm -hmm. carbon dioxide emissions and climate change, climate change, global warming, and the damages to the economy, and then from there to policy that could be used to slow the warming. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we did work. I mean, I don't. I'm just a per, one of many, many people who've been uh, doing this. I'm sort of representatives of many people, but and then the second thing was be able to do that quantitatively, mm -hmm. not just get the, the analysis, but also do it quantitatively, so you could actually make calculations about or projections. I would say about what might happen if this happens, and that would happen. This would be the future. What kinds of steps? What kind of dollar prices you could put on things? So the basic idea was that this award was for putting together the ideas from many different fields in an integrated fashion and then implementing those in, in a computerized form that can be used for analysis, for mm -hmm. science, and for economic and, and climate change policy. Yeah, and, and it seems like one of the most important parts of this whole research was centered around you know, how many degrees can we allow the Earth to rise before we have serious problems? And there's a lot of discussion back on back and forth of what that degree is. And um, I'm just wondering, has there, you know, become any kind of consensus now on what we can tolerate? Is it one and a half degrees, two degrees, or is this something that we're still trying to figure out? Well, I think this is something where we've we've focused on two degrees or one and a half degrees, it's a, a way of literally focusing. It's a way of focusing people's attention mm -hmm. on what is a tolerable limit. I don't think there's any specific cliff that if you are 1.9 degrees, societies will be fine, and if you're 2.1, you'll be in catastrophe. Yeah. It's more that the, 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 the more the, the globe warms, the worse it is, and it gets worse in a pro kind of progressive way, in what we yes. call a nonlinear way. So that uh, going from going from two to three is worse than going from one to two. Going from three to four is worse than going from mm -hmm. two to three, and so sure. on. Um, but I, but my own view is that there's not any cliff that there's going to be reached, and you can say we know that two two degrees or one and a half degrees or two and a half degrees mm -hmm. is exactly the right number. What I'd like to say is it's what. Whatever the right number is, it's not six or seven or eight degrees, <laughs> and that's basically where we're headed if we don't take steps yes. in the in the reasonably near future. And that's where the globe is heading. So I would really like to say, look, whether we can keep it to two degrees or one and a half degrees, well, that that would be good. But let's surely <laughs> prevent it from going to six, seven, eight degrees. Those are yeah. those are Celsius degrees. So yes, that's multiply important. those roughly by <laughs> two to get what most people in this country think about, which yeah. is Fahrenheit. One of the important things that you said was that um, it is not a linear system. In, in other words, just like you said, one degrees will be very different than two degrees. And um, it's almost like a, a diminishing return kind of comparison here, where it may cost you know, X amount of dollars to prevent us to get to two, but it may be twice the amount to you know, prevent us from going to three, something like that. Can you kind of explain at all why that is? Why is it not a linear system? Well, there's a really interesting example of that, which are the giant ice sheets. And the one that we've studied most carefully, um, and there's a whole team of people, and I actually have studied this myself, but as an economist, is the Greenland ice sheet. Hmm. And it turns out it's a system that's extremely sensitive to what the temperature increase is. And we're not sure exactly what the, what the threshold is, but somewhere between one degree and two degrees above where we are now, it will trigger slowly, but in a really almost irreversible way, a melting of the, of the sheet. So you'll have a small amount of melting if there's one degree, and maybe a small amount more if you get to one and a half degrees, but when you get to somewhere around two degrees, then you basically start a, a much sharper, irreversible warming that basically goes down to 
almost no ice sheet at all. Mm. So that's an example of a very severe nonlinearity. Now, it's not an overnight linearity. Mm -hmm. It's something that will take hundreds or maybe a thousand years, but it's an example where you get past some threshold, then it, it gets warmer. As it gets warmer, it melts. As it melts, it gets lower. Lower is warmer, so it melts faster. And then you have another factor that as, I, as ice sheets melt, they become darker. Hmm. And so they absorb more sun and they melt faster. So you have this, wow. you have this feedback effect whereby the warmer it gets, the faster it melts. Yes. The faster it melts, the warmer it gets and, and hmm. keeps going. So that's a, that's a very dramatic example. I think we know pretty well that where you have this very, very sharp nonlinearity. One of the, there are many proposed solutions on how to handle this, but you are considered one of the originators of the carbon tax and everything surrounded that. How has your, um, how have your thoughts on the carbon tax idea evolved over time? Well, they started a long time ago when I first started uh, working on this because we did we did some work with some modeling, and what came out of it was when it wasn't a carbon. It was not a carbon tax, but it was the idea that if you were going to take steps, you needed to have a. It was actually a price hmm. on carbon emissions, and it just it was something that when it came out, it actually not didn't literally come out, but it was actually on the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I said it was very strange. I, it took me a while to understand. What was it saying? This it's what's known technically as a shadow price, hmm. in in the linear programming literature, and I took me a long time to understand exactly what this is saying. And then, after a couple of years, I said, "Oh, it's talking about a price or a tax that you need on emissions to reduce the level of emissions." Hmm. So this this was where it first started, in at least in my head. <laughs> um, I would say for many years I was I was. I was not very confident. I was quite diffident about the idea, and it was seen as a somewhat wild idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, as we became more certain about what was happening, about the warming of the globe, about the impacts, about how dangerous it was, uh, then kind of, I kind of changed my view and said, you know, I, I think this is the right approach. Yeah. Um, and I, I think what I think many men, I've been reinforced by the fact that my colleagues in economics and increasingly in the environmental movement have now come to the view that really pricing carbon is the critical step. Mm -hmm. gonna, it is the essential step if we're going to slow global yeah. warming. Yeah, we've seen countries starting to implement things now. And how long do you think it will be before maybe the United States or other, before it becomes a popular Thing around the world to actually have a carbon tax. Is this something that could be five years or is this yeah. 20 years? I don't know that it'll ever be popular. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you might say our Social Security, I mean, I like, I like, I think all of us like to look forward to getting Social Security when we retire, yeah. but it's not popular that we pay Social Security taxes, so <laughs> I don't fair. think it's ever popular. But I think I'm hoping people will come to see it as an important step, an important ingredient to undertaking the policies we need to slow climate change. Uh, it is, I mean, it, it is what I call a good tax. Yes. I mean, most taxes are bad taxes. Or, I mean, taxes, I mean, who wants taxes on your income? Who wants taxes on your savings? But this is a tax which not only raises revenue, but also reduces things that are harmful. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's what I say, let's tax bads, not goods. I've seen various ways for the carbon tax to actually function. You know, there's the, the standard way where you have a carbon tax and the government is responsible for distributing the funds for what that money is used for. I've also seen some systems where, um, let's say there's a carbon tax and that amount is credited back to the citizens. Yeah. And they are allowed to take that money and invest it in sustainable things like solar panels or whatever they might need to do. Um, do you think it's it's better to have a system that distributes the funds to the citizens, or should it be handled on a, a governmental basis? I, I think it's whatever the citizens want. I yeah. mean, it, it might be that in some places you would take a carbon tax and you would use it to replace other taxes, for example, you might replace income taxes 
or social insurance taxes with carbon taxes. In other places, you might feel, you might find that you're running a huge government budget deficit and you need the revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, in other countries, you might find that this is a convenient way to collect taxes compared to other taxes because there's a lot of tax evasion in countries. In some places, you might say, well, we don't really need the revenues, but we need investments. We need to find the funds to build windmill, windmills or to, mm -hmm. to do uh, research. So I, I think this, this is a matter for countries to decide. And in some sense, it's also what is, what is um, the kind of path of least resistance to getting it done. Because mm -hmm. the important point is to get the carbon price up. It's yes. not how you use the revenues. The important point is to make people, companies, individuals, governments, uh, pay for their carbon emissions. Well, I think we're going to be closing up here in a little bit. But um, there's one topic I'd, I'd like to just kind of close with. Um, there are obviously still people in the world that do not believe in climate change and they have their own views on on why you know we're seeing increases in temperatures and things like that and you know i i think it's it's up to find it's up to us to try to find ways to convert more and more people to believing that this is truly something to be concerned about and one thing that i've been considering is the possibility that maybe there's a marketing problem going on. Maybe the way we are portraying climate change is almost a marketing issue. Um, one thing I was reading the other day was this kind of statement where we are very good at handling clear and imminent danger, you know, things that are right in front of us, but we are not very well equipped at handling these kind of ambiguous, long time, you know, long time scaled events. And we need other ways to kind of present climate change. Um, and I'm wondering if we can view climate change as more of an, an opportunity instead of a, you know, a, an Armageddon type of situation where we can look at this and say, you know what, it is generally just a good idea to try to achieve more efficient technologies and higher levels of standards for engineering and things like that. And maybe we can collaborate and say, it's, it's time to develop new technologies and come at this almost from the point of view of the space race and say, this is a big issue and we want the United States to be leaders in developing these technologies. Do, do you think there's room for a slightly different marketing approach for how this could be handled? Well, I, th I think uh, there are a couple of things. One is I think we do have to start with the fact that this is that we are heading into dangerous territories. Mm -hmm. And the analog I think of is like, it's, it's like smoking. It's like we have to persuade people that what we're doing with climate change is like smoking. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, most people didn't believe smoking was harmful. And particularly smokers didn't believe it was harmful. <laughs> they didn't believe it caused cancer. And it took a long time, a lot of persuasion, it took mm -hmm. advertising, it took people just lots and lots and lots of discussion for people to recognize, but minds have been changed and people now, it's gone from 20 or 30% of people who smoke to 80 or 90% of people who smoke who realize it's dangerous. Yeah. So I think part of it, we have to recognize it. The second thing I think we need to recognize is that undertaking to slow it is not gonna wreck the economy. It's not free, mm -hmm. it will be some, dis there will be some displacements and some disruption of our economic activity. But if we do it in a careful, thoughtful way with carbon pricing, gradually over the next one or two or three decades, we can do this without having a really large effect on our living standards. It's not that it's free, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be, if it's done effectively with carbon pricing, it will be done relatively efficiently and inexpensively. And then there's the point you make. There are also some important side benefits. Mm -hmm. For example, the kinds of technologies that we use now for energy, particularly ones that are fossil fuel based, and particularly ones that are coal based, are very dangerous, mm -hmm. not just for the climate. Coal based technologies kill two or three or four million people around the world every year just from the air pollution. 
There are probably 20 or 30,000 people a year in the United States who die from the air pollution, from the combustion of fossil fuels, particularly coal and power plants. So it's not, this is not just something for the next generation and the generation beyond, it's now. So taking steps to do this, to move to renewables, cleaner kinds of power, cleaner kinds of engines, uh, it will have a direct and immediate effect on the health of our, of our populations as well. So I think that it's important it has side benefits, and it's not that very that all that expensive. I think that's the kind of way we can market it. Mm -hmm. But but it's an important. It, it is important that we do this and that we start on it soon. I saw the other day the New York Times wrote an article about you, and it, it said, in short, the world is becoming a laboratory for theories that Professor Nordhaus developed decades ago, when the global warming was just an abstract future threat. So, I really hope that that continues and um, they continue to expand on your ideas and more people follow your work. And um, I wish your team a lot of success in the future. Thank so. you so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you and good luck to Brantford. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.